But I think it's important to realize that the attitude you have, your mindset towards menopause can really impact your experience of the transition. There are parts of the world, like in Japan, where women do not have hot flashes. They don't wake up at night for night sweats, even though they go through menopause the same way we do. And the interesting thing is that the word menopause in Japanese is konenki, which doesn't mean the end of your menstrual cycle. It means renewed energy. It means a new phase of life. Hey everyone, before diving into the episode, I want to take a moment to invite you into our Mind Body Green ecosystem, where you can explore the infinite possibilities of health and well being. All you have to do is click the subscribe button to hear more thought-provoking interviews with leaders in the health space. I am so grateful for all of you who have tuned in over the years, and let me tell you, it's only going to get better. So in the book, you say that most women spend 40% of their life in menopause, and by 2030, 1 billion, 1 billion with a capital B, 1 billion women will have entered or about to enter menopause. So what do we know about women and what's going on in their brain during menopause? This is such a fascinating question and a question that I think we should all be really mindful about, in part for the reasons you mentioned, that women are half of the world's population. And menopause does not happen overnight. So it's really important to realize that menopause, number one, does not happen when you're old. That's a misconception. The average age globally is 49. So that strains at the definition of old age by any standards. And most importantly, you don't just happen to go through menopause. It's not like when you have your period that just one day hits you and that's the end of the process. Menopause can take years. Transitioning to menopause and the absence of a menstrual cycle can take anywhere between 2 and 14 years. And what we know about those years is that they can be easy, but they can also be hard and demanding, especially on women's brains. And that is really the big part of my work, it's a key component of my work, to study the menopause brain, what it means, what it does, um, why it happens, and how to feel better as you navigate those important years. So what are some of the things that are happening if this starts years before 49, maybe we start in our 30s. Can you walk us through like what's happening in the brain in 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and beyond? Like what, what should women be aware of? What, they, what should they be looking out for? Are there labs they should be demanding that their doctors give them? Mm -hmm. So they should think about this as a process that actually starts as soon as we're born. Because the truth for women's brains and women's bodies is that we are born with a system, the neuroendocrine system, that connects the brain to the ovaries. We're born with it. However, this system is activated as we go through puberty then is overactivated as we get pregnant, every time we are pregnant, and then it gets partially turned off after or during the transition to menopause and more so after we are in menopause. So the way that this process impacts your brain is that everything is fine until you hit one of these very important transition states, which I call the three Ps. Puberty, pregnancy, perimenopause, which is a transition to menopause. Those are neurologically active states. It means that your brain is just as impacted by these processes as much as the ovaries are. We're just not used to thinking about that as a neurological process or something that impacts your brain as well. So that is important to know because a lot of women are really scared of menopause. They're really confused. They don't know what's hit them. They don't associate the symptoms with the process of going through menopause, in part because they feel like, I'm not old enough to be going through menopause. I'm in my 30s. I'm in my 40s. What is this? It's actually menopause. It's a process that takes many years that impacts your brain in ways that are subtle, 
but consistent. And you may have seen some of the symptoms as you go through puberty or pregnancy as a woman. They're just stronger, sometimes more severe as we go through menopause. So when women say that they're having hot flashes, night sweats, insomnia, depression, anxiety, brain fog, brain fog is a huge concern, memory lapses, those are symptoms of menopause. They don't start in the ovaries, they start in the brain. Those are brain symptoms that are triggered by the way that menopause changes the brain. So one, one I want to spend a moment on, so you mentioned brain fog. Yes. And I'm sure a lot of women are going to equate brain fog with possible early cognitive decline in the form of dementia and Alzheimer's, and they're, and they're freaking out because more women are more likely. Yes, 60%. Exactly. And so how does one, you know, these are some of the symptoms we feel, what can women do in terms of lab work, whether more specifically, it's like looking at hormones, like what should they demand of their doctor to really zero in on the symptoms and make the definitive connection that these symptoms are indicating that I am going through perimenopause or I'm a year away or two years away? How, how should they approach that? Yes. So that's a really good question. And they, I'm going to talk for a couple of minutes here to really answer that thoroughly. <laughs> okay. So actually brain fog is, one, is the reason that we started to look at menopause and the effects of menopause and brain health. Because as you know, my, my expertise is in Alzheimer's disease and the prevention of Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And we were getting all these women in the program who were in their 40s and early 50s saying, I think I'm experiencing early onset dementia, which is a big red flag for us because early onset dementia, the way it is defined clinically, it's very hard to manage. And then it turns out more often than not that the symptoms are not dementia, they're actually menopause. They're just so hard to tell apart. So we have come up with a system that addresses the brain fog and is able to clarify whether or not this menopause is something more serious that can impact you down the line. This is something that's not being routinely done because menopause is, uh, is not the best term perhaps, but it's been pigeonholed as an issue with the ovaries, right? The brain component is usually disregarded in our medical field. And therefore, women of menopausal age will go to their ob -GYNs. But ob don't do brains. They are not trained. It, it's just they, they can't. They cannot. They're not supposed to be managing or diagnosing anything brain-related. In fact, most ob are actually not even trained to manage menopause in the first place. It's one in five. Whoever receives any menopausal training in the United States of America is one in five residents who get any training at all. I, I just want to pause there for a moment. That's a pretty big, essentially, every, every woman in the world who, who is fortunate to, to live to a certain age goes through menopause, and they will go to an OBGYN. And you're telling me that only one in five OBGYNs Ha it has actually the necessary the, <laughs> the expertise in this thing, and they're in that, that's a pretty problem. Not even the expertise. It's one in five residents who retrieves who receives any training at all. Wow! But the training could be like ten hours in total, which is not enough. So should women just like not go to their OBGYN when they're experiencing, or are they are they better served going to? Because this is a big this is a big deal. It's a problem. It's a problem. But the way that you find the right person, the right specialist for you, is that you need to ask for their certifications. So OBGYN, OBGYN, I say OBGYNs, but um, the specialists who have been trained to manage menopause are usually certified by the North American Menopause Society. So you just look for their qualification. You ask, are you a menopause specialist or not? Every woman who's listening, write that down. Do that, it's very important. There aren't that many. So it's really important to find the right specialist. So anyone in New York City, I would recommend Wild Connect Medicine in part because I work there, but in part because we have a midlife clinic where 
all clinicians really specialize in menopause care and they work with us for the brain component. So we have this integrative approach where women who are really concerned about brain fog, memory lapses, um, reduced focus or concentration, or just feeling like hot on brain, or we call it mental fatigue, brain fog or cognitive fatigue, they can come to us for testing. And what we do, so the blood work may or may not be necessary for menopause because the levels of hormones fluctuate very widely until you are in menopause. But the difficult years are prior to that point. So once you no longer have a menstrual cycle, the system, the neuroendocrine system, the brain hormone system is still a little bit in a flux for like two to three years. But then usually things start to settle down and like estrogen bottoms out and progesterone is very low and other hormones called FSH and LH are increasing. And that in a way corroborates the diagnosis of menopause. However, if you don't have a menstrual cycle, you are in menopause. You know, there's not much more that the labs can tell. Labs are more helpful when you're younger in case of primary ovarian insufficiency like women who are like in their 30s or early 40s and are having, just don't have a menstrual cycle or don't have a regular menstrual cycle or are having trouble conceiving. In that case, those tests are helpful. And also for women who undergo menopause for surgical indications. So once you have your ovaries removed before the, the age of menopause, then that is called surgical menopause, and it's a different process. It could be more severe, and sometimes tests are helpful because like, if you had your uterus removed but not the ovaries, you will not have a menstrual cycle anymore. Or in case of a procedure called endometrial ablation, which is helpful for women like with endometriosis sometimes, then you no longer have a menstrual cycle, but you're still having your ovaries so the system is still active. You're not actually in menopause. It's just hard to tell these things apart. So it's important to go to a specialist who can really guide you and tell you where you are on the menopausal spectrum. For your brain, I think I strongly advocate for women to see us, like brain specialists, people who can do cognitive testing on you at a minimum, right? You're worried about your cognition. Come come to us or other um, centers who can do a cognitive testing on you. Is there a directory for those, you know, we've got an audience all over the world. Is there a directory they can find online of people who can help them here or, or things they should look for in a practitioner or questions they should ask? So there are Alzheimer's prevention clinics that are now emerging throughout the country and also in Europe. I think there's one in England I can send you the links of those that I'm familiar with. We'll link, to, link in the show notes. Thank you. Yes, great. There's um, a wonderful center in Cleveland, like in Las Vegas. Yeah, I'll send you, I'll send you the links of all the clinics I'm familiar with because that I think is really helpful. You know, more than a blood test, they can't tell you much about anything at that point. Come to a, come do a kind of test, get a brain scan. I do brain scans on all of our patients and participants, and it's extremely reassuring for them to know whether or not there's something in their brains that could be a trigger for those symptoms. Because if your brain is fine, then you can really relax. And we also have a good baseline. So we can keep repeating the brain scans to make sure that there's nothing ongoing that just didn't show up on the first image. So in terms of brain scans, come get one. The, the full body scans are, get, are getting a lot of attention, specifically Pranuvo. Colleen and I are going to do ours in a couple of weeks. Uh, would that be something that would show up in a, in a full body MRI, which they're also imaging the brain, or is it something more specific for those interested? It depends what you're looking for. So the total body scans are really good for cancer and for early detection of structural issues. What we find uh, in our research on menopause, we're talking menopause, yes, not cancer prevention here. Menopause, yes. For menopause or cognitive changes, then the changes are not, they're more functional than structural. So a stru an anatomical image will not tell you much unless you have a very severe issue like a stroke, uh, infarcts, 
or you have a lot of atrophy, or there's a tumor in your brain. These are all things that we also screen for. But then you want to do functional sequences, which is what we add on top. So we look at blood flow to the brain. We look at connectivity in the brain. We look at metabolic activity in the brain. And most importantly, we look at Alzheimer's markers. Because if you don't have the markers of Alzheimer's disease, then your risk of having Alzheimer's disease are basically different. And, and remind us, can we do a, just a quick reminder for everyone, what are the markers of Alzheimer's in terms of genetic testing that people should be aware of? Right. So there's genetic testing, but there's also biological markers. I was thinking biological markers. So Alzheimer's disease is defined uh, pathologically by the presence of very specific lesions in the brain. There are the Alzheimer's plaques that everybody's heard of, most people are familiar with. And then there's another marker, it's called neurofibrillary tangles, or just tangles. It's a different protein that kind of clumps up inside the neurons and damages your brain cells from the inside, whereas the plaques are in between neurons and interrupt communication. And now we can measure these markers in the brain by doing brain scans. We can measure them in the cerebrospinal fluid by doing a spinal tap, but we can also measure them in blood. So this is very new. Wow, what's what's the blood? I'm assuming what's the the specific blood that someone can ask their doctor for? So not all doctors can prescribe that. However, if your doctor is able to do that, then you can use like a lab like Quest. There's a good company that we like. It's called C2N. I have no conflicts of interest. I don't know them. These are just the companies we use. And you can ask for the Alzheimer's early detection test, and they will check. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, it's just the blood work. It just really just is the same thing as going to your doctor. But I want to be clear that it's not something anyone can get done easily at this time. Your insurance may not cover it. So there are there are things to consider. A good way is to be part of a research study or an Alzheimer's prevention clinic that can probably do that for most people. That's an incredible for people who, who really want to take take this to the next level. Yes. And for genetic markers, the one marker, so there are, can, can we talk about this for a minute? Because this comes up so much in our hands. There's so much confusion around what it means to have the bad Alzheimer's gene. And I think something happened on television that may have confused at least a lot of our patients. So there are genetic mutations that cause Alzheimer's disease. Those are the bad Alzheimer's genes. We know quite a few genetic mutations, but the, the strongest ones impact three specific genes. And I, I assume nobody's ever heard about these actual issues that these, these genetic mutations that cause Alzheimer's disease, they are mutations in the amyloid precursor protein in the presenilin 1 and 2 genes. They run in families, and they're highly penetrant, which means that if you have the mutations, your chances of getting dementia are very high. You may develop dementia at a young age, in your 30s, 40s, 50s, early 60s. All right, so these are genetic mutations. You don't get them from 23andMe you have to go through a doctor and do a serious CLIA certified lab work. It's a double copy of the APOE, right? I, do I have that? It's a complete different thing. This is what people think is the bad Alzheimer's gene. That is not a mutation. So let's clear this up. So what do people think and what's accurate? So people think that the apolipoprotein E, APOE gene is the bad gene for Alzheimer's disease. I would like to clarify it, that there are genetic mutations where you have an actual issue in your DNA, and then there are genetic risk variants. And I was just explaining that to my daughter the other day. So <laughs> I should be able to do that. <laughs> it's a very precocious daughter. Your daughter's nine. She's learning about genetics. This is amazing. I love that. Yes, yeah, so my husband works in biosafety and biosecurity, so this is the typical dinner conversation. But, okay, genetic, no, it's, it's true, it's, it's bizarre, but it's true. So genetic mutations are things that happen to your DNA, where your DNA is structurally changed. There may be one piece missing, then one 
maybe one piece has been duplicated. There's something that happened to your DNA that should not have happened. And it happened to you and your family and could trigger Alzheimer's disease at a young age. Then there are genetic risk variants, which means that every person has different versions of the same gene. So this apolipoprotein, this ApoE gene, comes in three different forms of variants. There's a, they're called epsilon from Greek, right? So there's epsilon 2, epsilon 3, epsilon 4. You get one from the mom, one from the dad. If you have two copies of the E4, or even just one copy, your risk is higher relative to another person who does not have it. So people have the two or three copies. But it doesn't mean that you are going to develop dementia. There are plenty of people with an ApoE4 gene who do not have dementia. And there are plenty of people who don't have the ApoE gene, ApoE4 gene, who have dementia. It's a matter of risk. It's risk and balance. Yeah. Just to build off that, it's an important point. We believe, you, you know, your genes are not your destiny. Exactly. Everyone's got a family history they're not proud of or not or not excited about. Let me rephrase that, whether it's cardiovascular disease, cancer, obesity, you know, cognitive decline. And so for those people, I, 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 we'll come back to lifestyle because I think that's an important part of this conversation. But before we go there, just to close the loop on on labs, I think you've provided some incredible resources in terms of hormonal health, is there anything else that women in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and beyond should be asking for beyond, you know, a basic hormonal panel? Or is that, and and making sure they have the right physician who's who's trained? Is there anything else they should be demanding from their doctor? Yes, they should be asking about options because menopause comes for all of us. And it's really one of the very few scenarios in medicine where suffering in silence is not only accepted, but it's actually encouraged. When women go through the physicians, uh, the providers with a diagnosis, if you will, of menopause, the most common reaction is dismissal. Is that it's gonna be okay, it will pass. Just hold it on, you know, keep going, don't think about it, go to the gym. It's, it's completely unacceptable to dismiss a woman's suffering and symptoms and symptomatology just because it's not a disease, right? We, we're used to treating diseases, but menopause can really significantly impact a woman's quality of life, the relationships. It's very common to have low libido during menopause, especially during the transition. And this is something that can be addressed in many, many possible ways. We just never talk about these ways. So it's important to have your concerns validated by your provider. If they don't listen to you, there are many other providers who will. It's important to clarify what the symptom, what symptoms need addressing and how to do that. There are many women who just want um, you know, to use natural remedies like supplements, botanicals, lifestyle modifications. There are women who have a hard time doing that. And there are women who have very severe symptoms who would possibly benefit from hormone therapy. But hormone therapy has this terrible reputation, HRT, hormone replacement therapy. Yeah. Right. It's been demonized in ways that are so bizarre. Based on data, there was flawed. Everybody says that that data was just not realistic. And now we know better. We know that done the right way with the right formulations at the right time is actually safe for the vast majority of women, not all women, but many, many women who still opt not to take advantage of this option because of fear they may, that they may develop breast cancer or fear of the blacks, you know, the black box warning on the formulations, even those that have never been shown to have any risks. So we really like for all women to know that hormones are on the table for many women, more women than we previously thought, that they are now actually recommended by the North American Menopause Society for many indications. And that if you take them correctly with the right supervision from a physician who really understands you and your body and hormonal therapy, then it's something that may be worth considering for at least some women. So is there a profile that makes for a good candidate for hormone therapy? Well, it's really based 
on the type of symptoms you're having and your own risk tolerance and your own preference, right? Many women just don't want to take hormones and that's perfectly fine. There are many other things that one can do to alleviate the symptoms of menopause. But some women, for example, women who are going through surgical menopause because of an oophorectomy or a hysterectomy, then taking hormones is actually recommended by professional societies starting right after surgery and continuing until more or less the natural age of menopause, which is globally 49, but in the United States it's 51, 52. And also you can ask your mom. That's really our best predictor. Yes. So all women, this is a big, actually a big recommendation. Talk to your mom about her menopause because there's a genetic link in menopause. And if your mom went through menopause at 51, 52, chances are you will also go through menopause around that age. If your mom had hot flashes, chances are you'll have hot flashes. If your mom didn't have hot flashes, chances are you won't either. So there's, you know, it's interesting to, to find out. But for severe hot flashes, severe hot flashes, prevention of osteoporosis, low libido, vaginal dryness, for some women, sleep issues during the transition of menopause. And for some women, it's helpful for brain fog. So you mentioned women being dismissed by their doctor and, and say, go to the gym. So, so I do want to spend some time on lifestyle. Or take antidepressants. Take antidepressants or do psychotherapy, which is, is unacceptable. Not helpful. <laughs> And so, but, but I want to spend a moment, you know, going to the gym. There, there are lots of experts now preaching the power of resistance training, specifically for women in their 40s and beyond. So can we talk about resistance training and other things women can do from a lifestyle modification standpoint, starting in their 30s, that can really help, help them through this process? Yes. So research on menopause is scant, <laughs> to put it gently, <laughs> but the research that we have shows a consistent pattern of benefits depending on the type of exercise you're doing. So if you're doing cardio, that seems to be especially helpful for thermal regulation, body temperature, so it really helps uh, mitigate hot flashes and night sweats, and also seems to help for cognitive health, cognitive performance, and brain fog. So if these are the main issues, we might want to incorporate a little bit of cardio in your routine. Strength training, very helpful to activate cellular metabolism, preserve muscle mass, preserve bone health, also for mood. So if you're having depressing symptoms or anxiety or anger, some women really experience anger and irritability, even rage during menopause, strength training seems to be helping at least some women relieve some of their tension, I suppose. And then there's flexibility, balance and flexibility exercise, like yoga, Pilates, Tai Chi. There are many different um, options there. And that helps not just with uh, flexibility, posture, very important, and stress reduction, but also with sleep. So ideally, one would have unlimited time and would be able to do all of these different things. If that's not possible, which is probably a more realistic scenario, then it's helpful to know what kind of exercises may help you best based on your own triggers and things that you want to achieve. Yes. You know, when you mentioned mood and, and something that helps the mood of, of men and women every morning is coffee. <laughs> can, can we talk about coffee? Well, all day. I, I, you know, as an Italian, I, I love my caffeine, but I'm, so I switched to decaf. You did? Why? Yes, in preparation for my future transition to menopause, because caffeine um, keeps me up at night. It just makes me jumpy. I'm sensitive to caffeine. And something that people don't realize is that the half-life for caffeine is quite long. So once caffeine is in your system, it sticks in your brain because it's fat soluble. It really loves to stick to fat and your brain is mostly fat. So the caffeine in your brain actually sticks around even longer than it stays in the rest of the body. It's like 10 hours, right? Yes, it could be up to 10 hours, some people even longer. So if you have a cup of coffee at 2 p.m., you still have 25% of that caffeine after 8 p.m. And that is 
problematic sometimes. So that's Colleen, my wife. She, she we both enjoy coffee and we enjoy it uh, every morning. But her cutoff is like 10 a.m. where mine is closer to, pro to probably two. Me too. I had my cup of coffee before talking to you, even though it's big half. You never know. And it's really important to do them. Can you talk about some of the, the neuroprotective benefits of drinking coffee? And oh, caffeine. Oh, coffee. Yes. For those who don't get the jitters, who those who can enjoy it, whatever their cutoff time is, like talk about some of the benefits. Yes. So caffeine is a stimulant and have a really obvious energizing effect also on brain cells. But the real important thing in caffeine is that, sorry, in coffee, is that it contains antioxidants like theobromine, but also another number of very powerful antioxidants. And antioxidants are especially important because the brain and the ovaries are very sensitive to oxidative stress. So these are cells that do not regenerate. So in the rest of the body, all different cells regenerate, which means that they're renewed every few days, two weeks. Like your hair fall off and they regrow. Your blood cells die and get renewed. Even the skeleton is regenerated, it's just renewed at a rate of 10% every year. But the, the cells in your brains do not. For the vast majority, they're born with us and stay with us for life. And so do our egg cells in our ovaries. There's only so many. Once you run out, you run out. So the best way to protect those cells that do not regenerate, is to obtain antioxidants from the diet because oxidative stress is one of the major activators of cellular aging. It makes your cells age faster and it makes them more vulnerable to insults, to diseases, to toxins, to all things that can go wrong. So it's really important to take in antioxidants from the diet and coffee is a good source of antioxidants, in fact. A double espresso, which I used to drink <laughs> until a couple of days, a week ago. I know what happened. Yes, I know. I know. Um, but this is basically the beverage with the highest antioxidant power of all the of all beverages. Love it. So if you need to drink your antioxidants, a double espresso is like gold. If it doesn't give you up at night. So I'm curious. Do you have a view? You know, my wife has asked me. Like when do, we've had this discussion of when we started to drink coffee and, and I like don't really remember if it was high school or college or and I, I'm curious in your view, if it's helpful for adults, can it be helpful for kids, teens? Is there is there an age where you might want to consider consuming coffee in the morning? 25. 25? Yes. Because that is when your brain is fully matured and the white matter is fully in place. However, I will tell you this, that in Italy, you start drinking a little bit of coffee with milk when you're a kid. And if it's just a little bit, it's good because you get desensitized to the jitters. You know, you just get used to drinking a little bit of caffeine, your body just adapts to it. And once you're ready for an actual espresso, you don't get the jitters. You just get the positive effects. The same with alcohol. In Italy, what time? Like, I feel like kids are drinking double espressos in Italy. No, but we do have caffè latte for breakfast. It's a very typical thing. Yes, it's considered like maybe a quarter of an espresso. We actually do the mocha. We have the mocha machines, the Bialetti, and we'll do maybe a quarter of a mocha with a cup of milk. That's caffè latte breakfast. Got it. My daughter just started. Oh, so you can ease into it. So the so, we did have, we did have. But it sounds like for coffee, and if you want to go caffeinated, you should probably ease into it before age twenty-five. Yes. Okay. I'm glad you mentioned age twenty-five, and I've said this before on the show, and I'll say it again. I think the brain is still developing, and the more I read about young adults and teens and marijuana usage, it is just beyond frightening in terms of increasing one odds for psychosis, depression, schizophrenia, all sorts of, and, and I feel like we're rolling the dice in, in many states where it's legalized under age 25 or just legalized in general. Yes, I, I completely agree. I, you know, I, I worship brain health in some ways, and I really believe that your lifestyle can do a lot of good and a lot of bad 
depending on your choices. And then, because it, it's what I was saying just a minute ago, that your brain cells just stay with you for life. If you damage them, you don't have a second choice. You know, you really want to protect them for good, for the long run. And you do that by making smart choices on a daily basis. They drink water, <laughs> drink a lot of water. There, there's, there are so many things that one can do to protect brain health that we just don't know about, where nobody teaches you how to take care of yourself and certainly not how to take care of your brain. And it's such a pity, it's such a missed opportunity because we really need to start young. And, and so for those starting young, and you know, if we have a listener in their 30s right now, in, in your view, what, what are the, the most critical things they should focus on to set up you know, their, their brain health for success and also like perimenopause, menopause? Because as you, as you pointed out, it just doesn't show up one day. It, it's the process is starting. Yes, exactly. It's a very long process and you have control over at least some of uh, the processes involved. And lifestyle, I really believe that lifestyle is key. And my preference personally is always to optimize my lifestyle before asking for prescriptions, if I can. You know, within reason, obviously, there's a disease or an infection is different. But for, in this case, I think there's so much that we can do preventatively and proactively that we just need to think about. And they talk about all of these things in detail in the book, in the menopause brain. But to summarize, I think exercise is really important for overall health and brain health. It's been shown time and time again that it really supports the health of your neurons at all ages, not just when you're, when you're young, but also at all uh, stages and walks of life. Diet, I think, is really important because nutrients are not just nutrients, right? Nutrients are information, and they are the kind of information that speaks directly to your genetics. So when you choose to optimize your diet so that there is antioxidants and omega-3 fatty acids or polyunsaturated fatty acids and lean protein and anti-inflammatory compounds, this is not just something that's good for your skin. You know, these same nutrients will penetrate inside your brain cells and go talk to your DNA and tell your DNA what to do. They carry information that at the epigenetic level can really improve your health or the opposite. So diet is important. And I, I think, at least in my field, there is consensus that plant-forward diets are important for brain health. You have to eat just fruits and veggies. You have to eat the fiber. I don't care where you get your fiber, but there has to be fiber in your diet. It's really important. One interesting fact um, about fiber is that we're all familiar with the microbiome at this point, right? But there's one part of the microbiome that is called the estrobolum that is very specifically important for estrogen regulation. So there's one section or the microbiome that contains these very specific microbes, sets of microbes that make a specific enzyme. It's called, it's called beta-GUS, G-U-S, that helps regulate the levels of circulating estrogen throughout your body. So that's very helpful for women's health overall. And the way that you take care of, of your estrobolome as well as the rest of the microbiome is by eating more plant-based foods because that's what your gut bacteria want to eat. The fiber. Yes, fiber, oligosaccharides, yes. So probiotics, prebiotics, and bitters are really important in that respect. Gotta get your fiber. And it sounds like you, you basically described the Mediterranean diet when you talk about the unsaturated fi fats and... Yes, a green Mediterranean diet. You know, sometimes Mediterranean diet can, you know, includes... It's, it's a good diet because it's quite flexible. You know, if you want to have some red meat, you have some red meat. If you want to have your cheese, you have your cheese. Um, and that's all good for mental health, I think, to have a balance if you eat those foods and enjoy them. But the, the focus is on fresh produce. And we don't have or organic. We don't say organic in Italy because everything is kind of organic. Bio. You've got bio. Bio. We have the biological. <laughs> Actually, they taste different now. When I was growing up, everything was fresh and healthy. 
And now when I go to Italy to see my parents, I'm always like, no, 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 we're going to the biological, we're going to get biological food. And they're like, yeah, it tastes so much better. But so fresh fruit, veggies, uh, cold pressed oils, extra virgin olive oil, flax oil. I will throw some coconut oil in there too, because I think it's really good for you and it's delicious. But that's the pattern and then minimize or maybe try to reduce. Definitely get rid of processed foods if you can. Fast foods got to go. My one watch out with coconut oil is it's the, C, the C16 saturated fat. And for some people like myself, too much of that C16 sat fat, which is in coconut oil and coconut milk, can make your lipids go haywire. Mm, yeah, that's true. That's true. So that's like a genetic thing. It's just to watch out. You start, and I experience. I'm doing my own little test over here, and not so good for me. I'm better off actually eating like lean red meat over coconut oil because it does. It's less actually less sat fat. So something else that's interesting that a lot of people are talking about is potentially a benefit. I wanted to get your take: intermittent fasting for women pre and post menopause. What do you think? You know, I think it's it's interesting because. There's a tendency here to just give labels to everything. So now intermittent fasting is the thing. Yeah, but, we, you know, just in the Mediterranean region and in many other countries, we just call it sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> the world, you have dinner early because that's better for your digestion. And then you stop eating until you break your fast at least 12 hours later. So yes, I'm, I'm completely in favor. Finish dinner, wait, through, make sure there's a three hour gap, two to three hour gap between dinner and, and bed. Yeah, that would be ideal. And then that's it. You don't eat or, or drink other than water, maybe a chamomile tea, but then that's it until breakfast. It, you have to give your liver and your digestive system a good amount of time to just relax and rest and your brain too. Like you can't constantly... You know, every time you're eating something, your brain needs to supervise the digestive system. So you're keeping your entire body activated. So you, you do need to give yourself a break. I find that <laughs> intermittent fasting is now quite popular. And there are some things that are being said that are not based on science. They're based on personal opinions, like what you should be eating to break your fast. There has to be this specific amount of miso soup with three pieces of tofu. I think that is maybe a little bit pushing it, but I think that the principle is a good one. Not necessarily for menopause, but in general, yes, I think it's important to to just give your body a break. So as you pointed out, women, uh, let me rephrase that, as you pointed out, science is not exactly done the necessary studies on women during this critical phase of life. And I know that that's a, it's a passion point for you. You've done some incredible research there. If you could wave your magic wand and, and do a study tomorrow with all the resources and what would you do? Oh, I'm doing so many. We're so busy. We just, <laughs> we just started um, a clinical trial that I'm very excited about. We are testing the new generation of estrogens. They're called SERMs or selective estrogen receptor modulators. And we're testing one that is specifically engineered to go straight inside your brain and support energy levels in the brain and get rid of brain fog and possibly, we're hoping, reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease, but has no impact on the reproductive system. So there are no concerns around breast cancer or endometrial cancer, and I'm really excited about that. We're doing brain scans, as part of the trial, and we're working with women who are perimenopausal and early postmenopausal, and they are uh, also concerned about the risk of Alzheimer's. So I'm very excited about that. And we have a secret project that you're hopefully going to hear about soon. So I can't talk about it yet, but we're doing something that has never been done before. That's again around women's health and estrogen levels. Then. I'll just tell you, it's been sponsored by Maria Shriver, who is a wonderful human being and an incredible, she's the fiercest women's health advocate. She's been on the show and she, she is a huge supporter of the movement and, and, and of you. Yeah, so she wrote the forward for the book. I am so grateful. I'll hold the book up. Everyone should buy it. Yeah, she's amazing. And she's been supporting her research for years. And it's really thanks to her that we were able to just launch 
this project that I wish I could tell you about, but is, I can't yet. When can you talk about it? When's the when's the date you're able to? I think a couple of months. You'll have to circle back and let us know. We'd love to, to cover it. I will 100%. Yes, and your wife, I think she'll really appreciate it, I think, I hope. But also what we're doing, we're doing a project on surgical menopause. And just for context, sur surgical menopause is more common than most people know. It's one in eight women, one in nine women in the United States who go through menopause because they have their, their ovaries removed prior to the, their actual age of menopause. And the consequences may be more severe in terms of symptoms that are more severe, more frequent, more disruptive in some ways. And also the risk of conditions like osteoporosis, depression, anxiety, cognitive decline are a little bit higher relative to women who go through menopause spontaneously as part of the aging process. And most clinicians don't believe that the surgical menopause has an impact on a stronger impact on brain health. So what we're trying to do is before and after. We're working with uh, ob surgery at Wild Cornell. We're working with our colle colleagues in um, oncology. And we're doing brain scans on women before and after the surgery, which has never been done, believe it or not, the before and after. So we are trying to, to definitively prove that menopause actually impacts your brain health in all these different ways. Oh, and we have so many projects and my, my absolute favorite is that we're following women over time, doing brain scans every few years, every year, every couple of years, as often as they let us, <laughs> the women in the study, because we really want to map out menopause in the brain. It's never been done. I find it so offensive as a woman that the first, we did the first study showing how the brain really changed in women who were premenopausal, perimenopausal, postmenopausal. That was 2017 when we published it. It was the first time. It's ridiculous. On that note, what side, like what, what of all the studies, because there were no studies like 10 years, that it, it's sad. But the last time we spoke was 2020, just in the last couple of years, like are there any studies that you've been a part of or read about that have really informed your, your point of view or research going forward or you're excited about? My studies. Yes, yeah, a lot of my studies uh, for me personally, but also other people are now replicating our findings, which is, I mean, the relief is enormous, right? So, no, no, you want that. So which which study are you most, since, since we last spoke in 2020, like which study are you most proud of? The one that came out in Scientific Reports, which is a nature journal in 2021, where we published the largest scale investigation of menopause um, of the menopause brain um, by looking at hundreds of women and men. We had men in the study too, thank goodness, because I get this pushback all the time. Whenever I, I show that there's a difference between premenopausal women and peri and postmenopausal women, the constant pushback is, is not menopause, it's just age. I get it all the time. And I'm like, well, if it was just age, then men would show exactly the same thing, right? Men of the same age, and they don't. So that's very helpful to say that when you're premenopausal, depending on what we're looking at, but there's hardly any difference between women who are premenopausal and men who are the same age, we match them. But once the women are perimenopausal, then they show more changes in their brains as compared to men of the same age. They show reductions in brain energy, reduced or lower brain energy levels. They show different connectivity patterns. They show increased oxidative stress or reduced ATP production. They, sh they show more Alzheimer's plaques, some women, not all women, some women. And when you're postmenopausal, the difference is even more pronounced. So it's not just age. So basically I need to prove that it's just not aging. And we're also doing longitudinal observations. So over time, women change, women's brains change more after menopause as compared to men of the same age that are imaged at the same intervals. Can you imagine what I have to do to just prove the obvious? It's like what one would think it is pretty obvious. I'm curious, has that informed your point of view on potential interventions given your findings? Like what are some of those interventions that w that one would sh should consider. Yeah, something we're we're doing now is to look at lifestyle. You need to have a lot of people 
in a study, in an observational study, to really tease out the effects of exercise and diet and sleep, you know, sleep hygiene and stress reduction. Now we have hundreds and hundreds of women in the study. I think it's more than 500 data points easily. Do you want more women? Should we do a call to, back, call to action on the show? We can. We could. We could. Yes. We'll leave a link in the show notes if someone's interested. Yes, that would be wonderful. We take care of everything. You just need to be in New York with us. We do um, many things we do remote. We do like on Zoom, encrypted, super secure. It's like a televisit, but we don't charge anything. We cover all the costs. Obviously, it's research funds. And then we need you in New York with us for a day or a day and a half to do blood work, uh, to do a couple of things in person. Someone could fly in for that if they're really interested, if it's only a day. A lot of people do, yes. Okay, let's link to that. Thank you. Yes, that would be wonderful. Super helpful. And for interventions, we're looking into that, but um, I, I'm really interested in, in hormonal therapy. I don't think that we need to prove the lifestyle, that a healthy lifestyle is good for your brain. I think we've done it. Many people believe that. I think it's wonderful. We do need to understand how to give the hormones correctly, when to do it, when to start, when to stop. And I, I believe in a precision medicine approach where I would like to be able to look at every person's brain because we're trying to treat the symptoms of menopause that come from your brain, not from the ovaries. So I need to know how much estrogen does your brain want and need? How much progesterone is missing in there? How do I give it to you? So we need more research before I can answer, but I think we'll get there soonish, hopefully. So one last thing I wanted to cover is sleep. These hormonal changes can affect one's sleep. And if you're not sleeping, then it's going to affect your, it's, your you may have brain fog. It, it becomes this vicious cycle. So s sleep specifically, any tips for women? You know, they, they've got their their best practices, you know, the they're putting their phone away, they're sleeping in a cool room, they're doing all the, the right things, but like if their hormones are creating issues or there's hot flashes at night, like what, what, any advice for women who are maybe struggling with sleep as they're going through this process? Yes, so one reason the sleep is disrupted is that cortisol, which is the main, uh, is the main stress hormone, works in balance with your sex hormones. So when your sex hormones are fluctuating or reduced because of menopause, cortisol levels also start changing because this is the same system that needs to coordinate all the different hormones. So there's a tendency for cortisol to rise around two or three in the morning. And that could be disrupted because the adrenaline also kicks in. And, and a lot of women who are perimenopausal and postmenopausal have trouble sleeping. They have trouble not just staying asleep, but also falling asleep. Or the other way around, they have trouble not only falling asleep, but also staying asleep, which is the main issue. So there are a few things that can be helpful. One is stress reduction. It could be exercise, it could be meditation, it could be anything that helps you balance your stress and your cortisol levels. It could be melatonin supplements. The reason you wake up is that cortisol increases, therefore melatonin goes down. It doesn't stay in your brain for as long as it should. So sometimes a melatonin supplement may help. Sometimes magnesium may help. The research is not quite there. It's quite inconsistent. But some women, many women, tell us that magnesium is helpful. And then I would say low-dose hormone therapy could be something to, to look into. And also progesterone with vitamin C. There are some clinical trials showing that uh, taking progesterone with vitamin C enhances the properties of the progesterone. Understood. And one thing, uh, my understanding of melatonin is one, you got to be careful because you can build a tolerance to it. And two, it can also wreak havoc on your hormones. So it's like, it's a good reset. But if you start to rely on it, you're going to create another problem with your hormones. So um, it's a little bit like a Band-Aid strategy. Like if you really can't sleep. Yes. Because in, in Europe, you need a prescription for it. Yeah, uh, not always. Some, somewhere. In some countries. Yeah. So I think, I think it's important to know why you can't sleep. Right? If it's hormonal, then you want to address your hormones. If it's stress, you want to address your stress. If it's sleep apnea, you know what's interesting? Um, a lot more women than uh, we, we thought 
were expected, develop sleep apnea uh, around menopause. And they don't know because women don't snore as much as men do. So you don't have anyone who's like punching you at night because they can't sleep. And so you wake up, they, you're frazzled and you're exhausted and you feel like you haven't slept, but you don't know why. And it might be this kind of sleep apnea that is a little bit tricky to diagnose without an actual medical assessment because the symptoms are just, just not clear. And how would one go about doing that? You go to a sleep doctor. You need to go to a good sleep doctor. And again, I have a really good person in New York if anybody wants them. I have two. One is the sleep clinic at Wild Cornell. And the other one is the doctor that my husband went to, whose name I don't recall, but they will find it for you. Show notes. We'll leave it in the show notes. No, no, it's, yes, two really good physicians in New York City who really know what they're doing. They do all the testing and they really talk about, like they did x-rays. Um, they even work with dentists because sometimes you need to really reset the jaw, do some dental work, we work on the palate. So, yeah. We're going to have so many nuggets of goodness in the show notes. Uh, Lisa, we covered so much today. Is there anything we didn't touch on that you would like to or maybe leave our audience with some words of wisdom? Mindset. Can we talk about mindset? Yes, let's do it. So Western medicine and just the Western society conditioned women to see menopause as a number of issues and pitfalls, right? Women of menopausal age are pretty much ignored by medicine and science. They've been silenced by media and culture, although now there's much more of a movement where women are demanding attention, which is wonderful. It's very clear to me that women, women are superior to men. Very, 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 very clear to me and in our household. I think, I think we, we matter, we're helpful. And if there's an issue, it should never be, you know, a woman against the system. It should always be all of us working together against an issue. And we should be able to resolve the issue. So I really want all women to know that the symptoms of menopause are not the only meaningful thing about this transition. So menopause is a neurologically active state that is marked, yes, by vulnerabilities, but also by resilience. And the resilience part has been completely ignored and overlooked in Western medicine forever and ever. And the only focus is on giving you medication. So I think it's important to realize that the attitude you have, your mindset towards menopause can really impact your experience of the transition. So there are cultures and societies around the world where women do not fear menopause. They don't dread menopause, just something they embrace, they just get through. And that correlates with fewer symptoms. There are parts of the world, like in Asia, in some parts of Asia, like in Japan, where women do not have hot flashes. They don't wake up at night for night sweats, even though they go through menopause the same way we do. And the interesting thing is that the word menopause in Japanese is kunenki, which doesn't mean the end of your menstrual cycle. It means renewed energy. It means a new phase of life. It's just something that should not be dreaded. And that seems to really be associated with the fact that these women do not have the same symptoms we have. For them, sometimes the issue is frozen shoulder or like muscle pain. And the same in some parts of India, where women gain status after menopause. They actually, now they're, they have more freedom. They're allowed to do more work socially. They are looked up to. And they don't have symptoms of menopause rather than a change in eyesight. Wow. Yes. So there's increasing awareness that culture shapes our experiences and that our mindset can really help. So I think this is. It is important because menopause also has some goods. It brings us some gifts. And one gift is more happiness. This was very surprising to me, but there's very solid research showing that on average, women who are past menopause report more greater life contentment than younger women, but also more happiness than they themselves experienced before menopause. So happiness seems to follow like a, an inverted U shape, right? With the midlife slump, which is definitely a little bit of 
walking, you know, it's, it's not fun for many women going through menopause. But afterwards, there's something to look forward to. And I think that's really important. And those women develop more empathy after menopause, like quantitatively, you can measure it. And there is a tendency to develop <laughs> emotional transcendence, which many women would describe as giving fewer fucks. This is something that happens, it comes up a lot after menopause. The women don't care as much about things that would have been upsetting prior to menopause. They feel more relaxed about life, and more at peace with themselves. And there's a neurological reason for it, which is that one part of the brain is called the amygdala that usually reacts very strongly to negative things, gets tuned down by menopause and it still reacts positively to good things that happen to you, but is not as reactive to things that would have been upsetting. So you feel more at peace. You don't care as much about things that are potentially annoying or bothersome. So just more, yeah, greater life contentment. So I think that's important to to be aware of as well. Fascinating. Lisa, always a, a wealth of knowledge. Pleasure to have you back and congrats on the book. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me.